thanks very much for um, inviting me, Max and, and Tom. And there are really two reasons why I'm very excited about this conference. The first one is that, um, as some of you may know, I have responsibility for the um, proposals for Templeton World Charity Foundation. Uh, Sir John Templeton created three foundations, and one of the other foundations, John Templeton Foundation, is who we thank for this conference. And I look after Templeton World Charity Foundation. And a couple of years ago, we developed in parallel with what uh, Max and Antoine uh, Anthony have developed a, a theme of information, specifically to look at the power of information and ask the question, uh, does information have causal power or is its role merely explanatory? And um, George Ellis and Paul Davis and I came up with uh, these questions that we wanted to address under that theme, making it clear that for each question you have to specify what kind of information it is that you're talking about. And um, one of the advantages that World Charity Foundation has is that uh, there's no practical limit to the amount uh, of money that can go into any one project looking at one or more of these questions. And uh, we've now funded uh, eight projects that are, not, uh, that are up and running, uh, some of which are represented here at this conference. The whole question of information is such a big one and such an important one that there's plenty of scope for a wide range of projects to study it. So there are uh, eight that are going now, and there's another one that will be considered at a committee meeting, not very far from here, actually, in the Bahamas in February. So that's uh, one reason for my interest in this conference, and I'd be happy to talk to people about any one of those projects. And then the other reason is that um, in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2010, three of us here, Jeremy Butterfield, um, Anton Zeilinger, who should be here, but who's just got cut off, and I organized a conference in Oxford to celebrate the 80th birthday of John Polkinghorne. And uh, the conference was entitled Quantum Physics and the Nature of Reality. And uh, we've written up the uh, discussions that took place in the conference, which was specifically intended to formulate a series of questions about the nature of reality, where we felt there was some prospect of making progress in the coming years. And one of the families of questions was about what experiments would be useful for probing the foundations of quantum physics. And under that heading, we had three specific questions, which are the ones up there. And I see you photographing the slide. You're welcome to do that, but you can find it all in the paper that's referenced at the bottom of the slide if you want to read about it there. And uh, since that conference, progress is being made at an astonishing rate on each of those three questions. And just to give a particular focus to what I want to tell you about now, uh, I'll tell you about some of the progress that's being made on the first of those questions, uh, what experiments can probe macroscopic superpositions, including tests of leggett garg inequalities. And at the end, I'll bring that back to the question of information <coughs> and uh, show you how it relates to the information question. Now, the leggett garg inequalities arose out of Anthony Leggett's wrestling with the issues of the relationship between the huge successes of quantum theory, to which he himself had made notable contributions, and the very classical kind of experience that we seem to have in our everyday lives. You may know that Tony Leggett was an undergraduate at Oxford, and he read classics, and only after he'd done his first degree, did he start to learn about quantum theory. He got good enough at it to win a Nobel Prize in the subject, but he never lost the rigor 
of his undergraduate philosophical training in the classics. And 20 years after he formulated the Legate Dag inequality, he, he said, look, you know, there are sort of three ways of addressing this problem, and he puts them up there. And he said, if you force me to choose now, then I would grit my teeth and pick the second one, but not be very happy about it. And the Legate Garg inequality was devised by him and Anapun Garg to give you a rigorous mathematical way of evaluating experiments that would tell you whether in a given experiment what was going on was amenable to a classical macro-realist description. The <coughs> definition of realism that he's uh, chosen is a very specific one, and you'll immediately notice that it, both of the postulates are inconsistent with quantum theory, but they fit rather well with our everyday way that we experience the world. And I'm sorry, I'm standing in the way, Jeremy, am I? Um, where can I, I can see you resting. If I stand here, is that better? But then you can't hear me. I don't know which is worse, not to hear me or not to see the slides, or which is better. And uh, so here are the three postulates. There's actually a third one, uh, the two postulates. There's a third one which is implicit, which is that uh, causation goes forwards in time. It's called induction in this context but you can get that by making the second of the postulates um, you know, time symmetric. And although it's rather easy to state this, the experiments, it's so hard to do experiments that properly satisfy the conditions that uh, for a quarter of a century nobody could see how to do them. And then there have been a series of experiments, and the one that I'm going to show you uh, Tony Leggett has been kind enough to say is the only one that he regards as satisfactory. And uh, what the inequality consists of doing is of taking uh, the state of a system at three points in time, time one, time two, and time three, and then uh, looking at the correlations and summing them in the way that's indicated on that slide. And the macro-realist view can only give, so anything that obeys these two postulates can only give a non-negative value of the legate garg function as um, stated there. Now, in the experiment that I'm going to show you, uh, the experimental system was the nuclear spin of a phosphorus impurity atom in silicon. And the uh, measurement was made using an ancilla which was the electron spin associated with that phosphorus impurity atom. You've got a question? Sorry? That's correct. Q, in fact, in the macro-realist case, it has the value either plus one or minus one. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes. Um, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, oh, yeah. Q is the value of that of that variable at any given time. It time is minus eight, plus one, minus one, is that the Correct. Yeah. Although even to talk in terms of eigenstates is assuming quantum language, which we don't want to assume. All right. Now, just before I, I I show you how it works out, this was a real experiment, and therefore it was not profit, possible perfectly to initialize the spins. Turned out not to matter very much if we couldn't perfectly initialize the nuclear spins, the system, but it mattered a great deal if we couldn't perfectly initialize the ancilla. And the reason for that is that we were going to use post-selection to say that if one of the ancillas changed in a control not um, operation, then we might have invaded the system and therefore, the second postulate was unsatisfied. But if the ancilla didn't change at all, then the second postulate was satisfied and we could accept those data. But if that one had been incorrectly initialized, then we might falsely deduce that it hadn't changed when actually it had. 
Now, we then examine two realist positions. The first one is, okay, that messes it up. It introduces some random uh, errors that you must take account of in your analysis. But then we considered the more aggressive realist who said, oh, you're trying to test foundations of physics. Maybe there's some unidentified process of working whereby these, um, uh, these incorrectly initialized <coughs> spins all give the worst possible correlations. Um, we used the term venality to describe these spins that were imperfectly initialized because they were liable to corruption. And uh, Serge Arroche redubbed our aggressive realist as a neurotic realist. Well, here are the two cases. The uh, parameter here is the amount by which we uh, change the system between one measurement and the next. In the quantum case, you can think of it as the rotation on the Bloch sphere. Up here is the Leggett guard function, and along this axis here is our venality parameter. The transparent surface is the predictions of quantum theory. The blue plane is the bound that would be set by the moderate realist. And the red plane here is the bound that would be set by this aggressive realist. This was a real experiment. Here was the pulse sequence that was used. And in the first experiment that actually Steph Simmons, who did this, did, she uh, got, well, the raw data is that point there. The gray data is the raw data corrected for known systematic errors. Here is the prediction of quantum theory. You can think of it as a section through that previous transparent surface that I showed you. There is the bound of the moderate realist. So, the moderate realist position is untenable. We're way below that. But we would not have excluded the possibility of the aggressive realist until Steph thought of clever ways using hyperpolarization to improve the experiment. There's the raw data. There's the data corrected for systematic errors. But it doesn't matter which you choose, because both of them exceed the bound that would be allowed either by the moderate realist or by the aggressive realist. I've gone rather fast through the data, but the one point that I want you to make is here is a fundamental question in the nature of reality that is amenable to experimental investigation. We then um, extended that to um, three dimensions in Hilbert space through something known as the quantum three-box problem, which uh, for me has its origins in a paper published by Yakir Aharonov and others also in 1985, the same year as the leggett garg inequality, although there have been um, uh, subsequent developments of it. And the basis of this is that um, you set up a game between two players. Uh, the owner of them is called Bob, and he believes in the macro-realist worldview. And the younger and more intelligent of the players is Alice, and she believes in quantum theory. And the game is set up so that if Bob is right, he will win. And if Alice is right, she will win. And it consists of uh, Alice putting uh, a ball in one of three boxes, shuffling them around. She then turns her gaze away. Bob is allowed to open box one or box two, look inside it, and if Alice later agrees to accept the game, then if Bob did not see a ball, he wins. <coughs> Alice then looks again. She does more jiggery-pokery. She looks in box three and decides whether or not to accept the game. And in fact, she only accepts the game if she sees a ball in box three. Bob, on his classical reasoning, thinks, well, the best Alice could ever do is get it right half the time. Alice offers him better than 50% odds. Uh, Bob accepts, and to his astonishment, in a perfect game, he finds that Alice wins every game that she accepts. So the quantum theory of this, and of course I'm just giving you a simple account of it, is that Alice initializes on this state, she post-selects on that state, and you can imagine that if uh, Bob uh, does not see a ball when he looks in box one, then you've got that state, which gives Alice a zero when she looks at this state. 
So we implemented this. Uh, we implemented it using um, negatively charged nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. Uh, it was a real experiment with real pulse sequences. And here are the results. Uh, actually, Alice can do a little check, first of all, to check that she really can't detect what Bob is doing. So um, she uh, has a look. When Bob looked in box one, does she see anything? When Bob looked in box two, and when Bob didn't do anything at all, he's not allowed to do that in the real game, but in the initial test you can do that. And theory says she should see something a ninth of the time. Actually, it's a bit more than that, because this is a real experiment with real errors. But uh, we'll see in a minute that this is good enough for the test that we want to do. And in particular, you can see that within experimental error, she can neither tell which box Bob op opened, nor from her statistics can she even tell whether or not he opened a box. So now can she win? And the answer is yes, she can win rather handsomely. There is the limit for macro-realism. And Alice is exceeding that by quite a large amount, and certainly rather more than the statistical uh, variation in the experimental data. So you can analyze this um, in terms of the legate garg inequality. And uh, the value of k, a little bit of algebra, will show you is this function of the conditional probabilities of Bob, um, if he looked in box one, um, finding the ball conditional on Alice post-selecting the game. And the key point now is the difference between these, uh, the sum of these functions between the classical macro-realist, where the probability cannot exceed one, <coughs> and the quantum theorist, for whom that probability must not exceed two, which gives you the rather interesting observation that had um, Bob looked in box three, perhaps by a weak measurement, he would have had a negative probability of one of finding the ball there. Anyway, uh, the point is that uh, this uh, violates the macro-realist assumptions by over 11 standard deviations if you assume fair sampling, and still over nearly eight, even if Alice is cheating, which corresponds to that uh, venality uh, that I was talking about in the previous experiment. So we can recast that in terms of the legate garg inequality. Here are the various different pathways. This square is the bound of what would be limited, allowed by macro-realism, and the blue curves represent the values of k that we actually got in our experiments. So you see one's pushing further the extent to which one can test these foundational concepts in actual experiments. Now, to take it further still, one wants to extend in the direction of uh, more macroscopic. What's that mean? Um, bigger objects, more complex objects, however you measure complexity, more dimensions in Hilbert space, more atoms, more photons. I think actually it wants to be pushed in all those different directions. And um, we're just advertising at the moment for two postdoctoral positions to extend these experiments in various directions. So I don't know how many experimentalists there are here, but if you've got friends who are experimentalists, please tell them to look out for those. Now, let me bring it back to the subject of information. And we had on the panel this morning, two minutes, two minutes left, we had on the panel this morning uh, Matt Pusey. A couple of years ago, he published, uh, or one year ago, they published it, but it was put on the archive two years ago, a very important theorem uh, showing that um, in certain circumstances, statistical interpretations of quantum states are disallowed. In other words, you cannot interpret them in terms of the statistics of underlying ontic reality. And uh, those original results are being extended rapidly. There's a new paper by uh, Lucien Hardy on the archive, or it was on the archive a year ago, um, 
showing that you can extend this kind of conclusion to restricted ontic indifference. His first two postulates are similar to Matt Pusey's. And then from an activity that I've been running in Oxford, which just finished last Tuesday, actually, um, uh, John Barrett, who worked with Matt Pusey and three others, have been able to relax some of the original restrictions in the earlier um, theorem, the earlier no-go theorem. So we've got rapid development here of theorems that are excluding some of these statistical informational interpretations of the reality of the quantum state. So just the last two slides, uh, how I got into all this was um, David Deutsch's work, also as it happens, in 1985, what a golden year that was, where he looked not so much at information as information processing and started to do what seemed like sort of nitpicking on the <coughs> Church-Turing hypothesis, but with the very important conclusion that once you started to look at information as being quantum rather than classical, whole new possibilities were open to you. And um, in, a, in a very significant sense, this was the manifesto for the whole field of quantum computing and quantum information processing. Not long after that, Rolf Landauer had a look at it and came up with, I think, the slogan um, of the, the physical nature of information. And he wanted to look at the, the, the almost platonic question of whether information is something that's sort of real out there that controls what the world is like. He rejected it. In rejecting it, he quoted the prologue to John's Gospel, and that verse was quoted by at least four of the speakers in their talks at the Polkinghorne 80 conference that I started by telling you about. And in the uh, theme that we've been developing for World Charity Foundation, this question of the extent to which the top-down causation by information is as important as the sort of bottom-up atomistic causation is a question that's being looked at in uh, various different uh, contexts, including the whole nature of life and what it means to be alive. So, <coughs> is information really physical? Well, I leave you with the question, and I leave you with those three sub-questions that I hope we'll discuss. <laughs>